VP of Oyotogo right now, Garam Joff uh, just on the right side of him. And the gentleman kneeling down at the front there is Sergei Dyakov, and he was the, uh, the leader from Magma's team. He was, it was his idea to go, go into the South Gobi, and that's him now. Now, I didn't even recognize him. Somebody else in here pointed, told me which of the two, you know, I knew who Dennis was, but I didn't know who Sergei, because he's changed a lot in the last couple of years. Anyway, BHP in 97, uh, they, they did the usual soil samples, uh, induced polarization, uh, gradient array, and op, gradient array uh, survey, geological mapping, and, uh, and more importantly, they did a regional aeromagnetic survey over the entire 1100 square kilometer block. They drilled uh, six holes in that first year in, 90, in 97. Uh, the, first, or the third hole of the group, hole three, uh, hit the chalcosite blanket about uh, 20, 30 meters below surface, and it had 10 meters of 2.39% copper, and that's this chalk secondary chalcosite. That's really fine, dusty chalcosite, usually coating uh, pyrite and also filling fractures. Hole four um, in South Oyo was really a stunner. They got 70 meters of 1.65% copper and 0.15 gold, and that certainly caught the attention of Hugo Dummett, who was then the VP Exploration in, uh, for BHP sitting down in San Francisco. They came back, of course, in 98. They drilled uh, another bunch of holes. Uh, in fact, uh, they drilled 23 holes in total, and probably the most important of that bunch uh, was hole 10, which was at the, which was at the uh, northeast end of uh, southwest Oyu. And that hole, right at the bottom of the hole, intersected 36 and a half meters of uh, whatever it was, 0.65% copper and 1.1 gram per ton gold. And uh, there was a big fault they'd gone through higher up in the hole, and the hole caved in, and they, and they never went back. They could never get back down to the bottom, so they actually couldn't, uh, you know, couldn't continue that hole. In all, BHP drilled 23 holes. Uh, they drilled on 400 meter centers or greater, uh, maximum depth of 250 meters, because at the time, uh, por porphyry coppers didn't go down that deep. Uh, at least you couldn't start that deep with a porphyry copper. And uh, they estimated 438 million tons at 0.48% copper and 0.25 grams per ton gold. And this was in 1999, and of course, BHP was in pretty severe financial straits because at that time they were taking a write down on magma copper. And uh, it was deemed non economic, and uh, they put it up for, for sale. Now, Doug Kerwin, who was VP Exploration for Ivanhoe Mines at the time and had been working in, in Mongolia now for a year or two and was very interested in the place, he had seen the, the core uh, that uh, BHP had uh, shown at the, the previous PDAC, and he was pretty impressed. Now, keep in mind, at this time, Ivanhoe Mines has just developed a uh, heap leach copper deposit in Myanmar. So the co thought of having a, a heap leachable copper deposit here on the other side of uh, China, and Robert's philosophy was, let's make copper around the border of China and feed it into, into, into China. So this really fit the bill, and uh, when Doug heard that the, the property was available, he immediately arranged a, a, a tour. He went down there, very impressed with what he saw, made the recommendations to Robert Friedland, and Ivanhoe then acquired 100% of Oyotogoi. And for that, they, uh, they did, we did $6 million of work, which was the commitment. They had seven years to do it, but we actually did that. We spent that $6 million bucks in two years. Um, I know Jack told you, you know, you give the money to the, to the geologists yesterday, they'll spend it. Well, we really did spend it very quickly. And that was followed by a $5 million uh, cash payment and a 2% NSR. Um, that's later that summer, uh, Mongolian summer, uh, Ivanhoe drilled 109 pretty shallow RC holes, generally about 60 meters deep, total of 8,800 meters, and uh, they to delineate the chalcosite blanket. Now, this uh, map that I got up here uh, is one that I uh, compiled in, in 2000, uh, November 2000. Uh, Doug sent me all the reports for Oyotogoi from BHP plus uh, an Excel spreadsheet with the results of the drilling. Um, all the other geologists that had been working on this had all scattered and gone away because the assays took so long to come in. And um, I sat in my little bedroom office and spent a couple of months putting all this together. And outlined here in yellow, in that sort of hatched area, is, is the chalcosite blanket. I did a polygonal block model with my little polynometer and figured out there was about 30 million tons of 0.8% copper. That was ultimately confirmed with, by RPA a, a year or so later. Um, but uh, I also show, you know, there's only three outcrops down there, which is what I show here. And this thing is dead. Um, so the, um, 
BHP's holes are all on there. Um, I'll draw your attention to, uh, you can see where BHP 10 is. Uh, and we'd also drilled, one of the holes we drilled with the RC was OTR 105, which is sitting down there between South Oyo and Southwest Oyo. I think you can, hopefully you can see it on the slide there. And, and um, this hole intersected 40, 40, 45 meters or so of a uh, couple of percent copper, and it was chalcosite. And, you know, at the time, everybody thought, gee, we got another chalcosite blanket here that has no holes around it, other than a few BHP holes. So that was the sort of the encouragement that, that got us back there in 2001. And uh, we took, we went, I went back in now as the manager, and uh, we drilled a bunch more RC holes around uh, OTR 105 and a few more around the blanket. Most of them were a bust. We certainly didn't add any, any resources to the, to the blanket at all. And as sort of the last step of the exploration, and I said, guys, you know, this is now to the, to the bosses. Robert Friedland wasn't in, wasn't in the picture at this point in time because we hadn't found anything really good yet. And um, there was a president uh, of Ivanhoe Mines and uh, said, you know, we got to drill at least three deep diamond drill holes on this thing. There's a real clear potential, uh, certainly under Southwest OU, for a, you know, an increase in the copper grades, probably the gold grades too. Um, the, the, the three holes in, in Southwest OU there, the northern one I've already given you the grade of, um, the, the two middle ones, the, the middle one and the one on the southeast, they were a couple hundred meters deep and uh, they had from 100 meters to 200 meters of 0.4 copper or 0.5 copper and 0.4 gold. But more importantly, the, the copper gold grades were increasing with depth. So the best assays were at the bottom of those holes. And they were 250 meters deep, and that's where they stopped, because that's what they had to do. So the first hole I put in uh, was uh, 149 there. And that was simply a, uh, a scissor hole to BHP's 4, because I kind of hoped that that, that intersection of uh, high-grade intersection of BAP, BHP's would have been thicker. It wasn't. Uh, all I did was duplicate the assays, so that hole was, was a write-off. Uh, there was a lot of question about whether we should drill any more, and I pounded the table and said, no, we're going to do 150 and, and one more after that. Hole 150 was then collared and drilled towards uh, hole 10, and uh, you see where hole 159 is there on central OU. Well, there's hole 150, and uh, that hole at 70 meters went in and started going into pretty good grade mineralization and ultimately drilled 508 meters of 0.81 copper and 1.17 grams per ton gold. And the grades, the 250 meter zone in the middle of that, where I've got the, the blue phallic sitting there, unfortunately, um, is actually 1.5% uh, one and, one and copper or so, and getting up over two, 2 grams gold. And essentially, Oyotogoy, Southwest Oyo has this gold-rich core, which has a, one, a 2 to 1 gold copper ratio, you know, PPM to percent. And uh, as you go down deeper below this thing, the, the gold copper ratio, in fact, increases. You can also see, you know, where that intersection was of BHP's hole 10. And in fact, um, when, we, when we model this thing, the 1% grade shell is 30 meters below that, uh, that drill hole. So BHP came close, but uh, no cigar. Um, so that's a, a photograph taken from a helicopter in 2006. It's a sort of a nice picture of, of Southwest OU. Uh, it shows the um, 75 meter bulk sample shaft that we sank in 2005 to collect a metallurgical sample. It shows you approximately where hole 150 was, pointing out under the there. But you, what you don't appreciate from this slide is there's very little outcrop on Southwest OU. In fact, there was a, the, the only outcrop that really is there is, is that's got any, not copper, and it's got some quartz fading wouldn't even would fit within the, this, this podium here. You really got to look hard. But what there, what there was, and nobody really appreciated, was the whole floor of the thing was, was littered with these black round cobble, cobbles. And when you cracked them open, they were quartz. And they'd all been rounded. And those quartz veins all had center line fractures to it. So there was no question that there was a significant amount of, of quartz in this thing with center line fractures, porphyry copper. It was, it was pretty obvious. Soil geochemistry didn't do very much, but I did run a line of collecting rock samples along that thing, and the average grade of those, those uh, rock chip samples was, was a couple of thousand uh, percent, or a couple of thousand ppm copper, and, and, uh, and you know, up, up to a, a ppm of gold, you know, a thousand ppb gold. So it was a pretty significant hit if you'd been doing rock geochemistry. Um, 
let's see. The, the other thing I should point out, of course I can't see it, I haven't got a pointer, but that's what 560,000 meters of core looks like stacked on pallets sitting out there in our core yard. You can see all those little dark things there. Wish I could point them out to you. Um, and probably the best thing I ever did logistically was to buy a forklift. And Dick would know this because he uh, spent a lot of time out in that core yard uh, with us shuff shuffling uh, pallet loads of core out for him and laying them all out so that he could, uh, he could look at it. Probably several thousand meters, I would think. Um, if you look to the northeast, uh, the low hills that you see where I've got OTD 150, 159, which was a vertical hole, that's central OU, and that was the third and final hole of the, of the diamond drill program. And that went down through 47 meters of, of the barren leach cap, it went down another uh, 49 meters of leach cap, and then, well, 47, then it hit 49 meters of 1.17% copper, which was the chalcosite blanket. There was a little gap of low grade, and then 252 meters of 0.81 copper and 0.11 grams per ton gold. So this was, uh, you know, this demonstrated that not only did Southwest OU have significant potential, but, you know, 252 meters of 0.8 copper is nothing to sneeze at either. On the slide also, as you look off to the, to the northeast, you'll see a red line there that says Hugo Dummett on it. And that's the approximate location of, of ultimately where the Hugo Dummett deposit is. Needless to say, we had no idea it was out there over drilling 159. And, um, and that's basically sitting there under 30 meters of, uh, of, of barren uh, alluvial sand and stuff. And then uh, from 200 meters to 1,000 meters uh, of very barren uh, Devonian uh, sediments and volcanics. Uh, the whole plain there is Cretaceous in age. In fact, the uh, chalcosite blanket was, was uh, dated by, by BHP, uh, Pepe Perello, uh, as Cretaceous. And when we sank that shaft, um, 2005, I guess, 2000, yeah, it was 2005, 2006, um, well, that, that little six meter shaft went down 30 meters through the overburden. And right on the overburden, uh, right on the bedrock surface, was a dinosaur nest with 24 dinosaur eggs in it. Because you think about that, you know, how, what sort of odds are there to stick a six meter hole down there and there's 24 dinosaur eggs. Um, anyway, I stopped the, immediately stopped the progression of the, of the uh, shaft. We got a got paleontologist down from, from Ulaanbaatar. They, they went down, collected the, uh, collected the, uh, the dinosaur eggs and I was able, allowed to uh, let the engineers go back to work. And believe me, they were pissed off. Anyway, moving right along. Uh, with the success of those drill holes, um, I was able to bring in a, a geophysics team. And uh, I chose uh, Grant Hendrickson of Delta Geoscience, and he lived in Tawasson, British Columbia. I'd used Grant uh, a few years earlier, in fact, back in 94, uh, on Tex-8 Island with his gradiator AIP. And we actually were pretty successful with that, with that gradiator AIP. So I dragged him over to Mongolia, and he went to work. And, and he did an 8 by 8 kilometer IP survey, a Blanc, uh, using an AB, which is the current electrode spacing for the non-geophysicist, on north-south oriented on lines. And um, what that did is, you know, it duplicated the, uh, the chargeability features uh, of central OU, south, southwest OU, and south. So that's, that was pretty much the same as what BHP had. But BHP, and that's, that's the small block that BHP covered, they didn't see that, and that's four square kilometers of pretty strong chargeability in this thing, and that we, de we deem the far north IP. However, now we had uh, pretty, good, uh, pretty good results there in southwest OU, so in central OU, so we spent most of 2001 and 2002 drilling off the resources, you know, in, in this part of the world, the southwest, central, and south, and uh, towards the end of 2002, with, with with a pretty decent resource now in the box for, for those deposits, we turned our attention to, to drilling this uh, far north IP anomaly. And the first hole in there was hole 244. You read that or not, but uh, about 100 meters below barren cover, we went into 108 meters of 0.73% copper. Now, given that we had, and no gold, now given that we've been drilling much higher grades down to the south, you know, we uh, thought, well, that's not bad, but still not that good. So BHP in their second hole had 15 meters of uh, percent copper sandwiched between dikes. And we thought, ah, copper grades are going to increase as we go to the southwest. So we duly stepped off on 200 meter lines uh, heading towards the southwest. Copper grades decreased. And when we finally got over to BHP2, there was no copper whatsoever. Now, 
there ensued then, you know, about three days of, of real debate, and I mean real debate. Do we quit the far north? Do we go back to drilling under uh, southwest OU? Uh, a couple of the geologists were emphatic, EMANS particularly. No, no, you know, there's, there's nothing going to be out there. In any case, we already knew from, from hole 250, which was a small drill rig, it, had, it, 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 was, it was collared about 350 meters east of uh, 244, and it went down uh, 375 meters before it gave up the ghost and stopped, and it was nothing but barren cover. So, you know, Emance and a couple of others said, you know, there's no way a porphyry copper is going to be, you know, these grades is going to be uh, economic and those things. Let's go south and let's see what, how deep uh, southwest oil goes. One of the other geologists, a couple of others, they said, uh-uh, 244 was the best we got. One more hole. So I, uh, I agreed with that, and we stepped out 200 meters uh, and drilled hole uh, 270. So 270 is right here in the middle. That went down 220 meters in absolutely barren rock. Uh, went through a, a dimbrite with not much in it, and then it, it uh, came out into a pretty high-grade uh, copper mineralization, dominantly chalcosite and proceeded on down through 638 meters of 1.61% copper and very low gold. And this was the discovery of, of Hugo South. We drilled up a couple of holes up dip, a couple of holes down dip, each similar grades or better, 100 meters off to the east, four more holes, still very good grades. It got a little bit deeper, but not, not radically. And, but during this time, Emats is uh, sitting there thinking about this, and uh, he's got, he had a huge amount of experience in southwest porphyries. And you look at the top, this is advanced argillic alteration, and intermediate alteration, and then argillic alteration, and then uh, down into more chloritic rocks. And uh, Emat said, you know, this is probably a leach, not a leach cap, this is probably, you know, an advanced argillic cap. And it should be sitting over a, a deep uh, porphyry copper here, you know, Lepanto type of thing. And uh, furthermore, uh, and more importantly, there's probably a major structure, which, which we did see in the core, and this structure is probably going to co control the orientation, you know, the trend of this high-grade mineralization. And down here you can see the, what the, the ore looked like. Uh, this is uh, from 270, and you've got these, these ghosted uh, quartz veins. You call them A veins, I guess, A Dick. And in a, in a sea of, of uh, siliceous uh, or uh, advanced argillic alteration, and uh, the quartz veins were intensely crackle brecciated and filled with chalcosite. And that really is what gives the grade of the thing. And there are several uh, veins there of boronite, and the boronite was a little bit later. But uh, certainly a significant, well, virtually all of the copper was, was in the, is in the uh, chalcosite. So Emats um, said, right, there's got to be a, a structure here. So he, he looked at satellite imagery, and he looked at the airborne magnetics. And he started looking at it, and he said, you know, there's, south, there's central oil here, the, the, the main part of the, the, uh, the mag low, which is probably the magnetite uh, destruction as a result of the high sulfidation mineralization. And he says, look at how well, that trends up there through that thing. He says, you know, that's got to be a structure. And that's north-northeast. He says, this thing is going to trend north-northeast. And I suggest that we, we drill our, uh, turn our drill rigs around and we drill a series of holes to the, to the southeast. And I said, oh, that makes sense, Emat, so let's do it. We drilled three holes to the southeast. Uh, turns out all three of them collared and went down through 100 or 200 meters of barren biotite granite diorite, which we had not seen yet at this time, and we were quite worried about it in the first hole anyway. It popped out of the granite diorite and proceeded to drill long intersections of very high-grade copper mineralization. We, uh, we then figured out that hmm, this is, these are going longer than they should in high-grade mineralization. Maybe we're drilling down dip of a tabular body, and uh, everybody agreed with that. So we turned the drill around and started drilling to the, to the northwest, and sure enough, we were, we were able then to define this tabular body. We then proceeded on stepping up along the strike extent of, uh, of that IP anomaly, and, um, you know, until we you know, eventually got up to Hugo North. But just a quick slide here, gradient array IP section. Um, we used this to a certain extent to, to guide us, but mostly we followed the mineralization. It was pretty easy to do that. Uh, and, and these gradient array IP sections, if you're not familiar with them, they're, they're made of by changing the AB spacing, which is the current electrode spacing, from 500 meters to, uh, to 11,000 meters, depending upon the resistivity of your rocks. And, and we used about a 0.25 times the AB spacing to give the apparent depth, focal depth, of the, of the, of the current. 
and of course, you know, it's not really exa exactly accurate, but sort of midway between, vertically between the midpoint of the MN, the two receiver electrodes, down 0.25 times that is where we plotted the chargeability values. And this was the, you know, the result of, of that exercise. And you can see a very, very strong, deep vertical chargeability feature here. And circled up here is the high-grade chalcocyte ore body. And it's clearly sitting over on the flank of the chargeability. It's definitely not associated with that. In fact, that is mostly uh, low-grade chalcopyrite and pyrite, which, of course, gives you a lot more sulfides than the high-grade chalcocyte does, given that it's 84% copper and chalcocyte. So it makes sense that this is much lower chargeability than this. Um, anyway, we continued drilling on 100-meter step-outs following uh, Hugo South, and about Christmas time, end of 2002, I went off for Christmas and uh, left Emance and, and David in charge. They didn't have wives and kids, so they were quite happy to stay there over, over Christmas. And then I hung around Vancouver for a month waiting for a Roundup convention. And during this period, uh, these guys got, to, they were really impatient with my slow progress of drilling 100 meters a step. You know, come on, Charlie, let's go. And so they, while I wasn't around, they went and they stuck a hole 300 meters north of the last hole on, on, on Hugo South and drilled 367. And I'll keep that in, in mind. That's the, that's the high grade intercept they got. And this was the drill section that they prepared uh, based on that drilling. And the, the first hole went down uh, 367 and um, 900 meters of barren uh, siltstones and, and basalt. They went through a big fault zone, and then they went into uh, 15, 22 meters of 2% uh, copper, and then the fault caved in and they lost the hole. But rather than walk away, you know, like uh, BHP did, they went back up the hole and they cut a, a wedge off at 425, and they drilled a shallower hole across, and that hole down here hit 164 meters of 4% copper and 1.42 grams per ton gold. And the really significant thing about this was that this was no longer a chalcocyte. This was now calcopyrite bornite in a, in a biotite uh, altered uh, quartz mons and diorite. So now we're, we're in good old, uh, you know, gold rich uh, case bar, or at least not potassium altered uh, quartz mons and diorite with, with really good gold grades. And uh, with that, we uh, then proceeded to continue on up uh, the axis of, of Hugo North. So, so what does the gradient array show you sections over Hugo North? Well, once again, now you get this really big chargeability feature. It starts way quite shallow and extends way down to depth. Once again, the high-grade kind of calcopyrite bornites that's over here on the flank. And uh, you know, it, it doesn't really appear to have much to do with the chargeability here. Um, much later in the program, uh, we did uh, drill uh, holes up here, mainly as a sterilization process because we did get some 0.6 or better copper gold down here. And we thought, well, we better make sure this doesn't come to surface uh, so that they could open pit something. And what we found is that the hanging wall ignimbrite uh, formation that sits above, sits in the hanging wall of that deposit, was full of pyrite. And this was about 80, these holes had been anywhere from 50 to 80 meters of pyrite in them, virtually no copper. And almost for sure, that's what's uh, char causing the, the chargeability anomaly. And uh, some geophysicists will argue quite vehemently that that's probably causing the entire chargeability, which I wouldn't agree with. But as it turns out, the, the best part of that chargeability is actually sitting on the west side of the West Bat Fault. And what the West Bat Fault does is it drops uh, carboniferous rocks down juxtaposed the Lower Devonian deposit. So there's, there's, to this, as far as we know, there's no mineralization out in those rocks. Now the next slide I had was going to be a really nice geological slide of that one, but it was prepared by the uh, mine team there a couple of months ago, and because it had never been made public, I can't show it. So, more recently, 2009, or two th end of 2008, 2009, after I left, and I left in two th uh, June 2008, Robert Friedland and Grant Hendrickson built themselves a, a very, very powerful IP transmitter. Uh, I think it's somewhere around about 100 uh, kilowatts, and, but I've never seen the specs. They called this Zeus, and you've probably all heard about Zeus if you pay attention to Robert's uh, press releases. And, and this is now uh, the, uh, the IP anomaly generated by, uh, you know, at a focal depth of 1,530 meters. And uh, you can see that now the, uh, the chargeability is pretty much focused along the entire strike length of the, 
of the, of the deposits. So it's certainly, and the idea behind the much higher uh, current electrode is that it, it gives you a better signal to noise ratio, so you get a better focal, focal you, bet, you get better focal thing on the, on the chargeability anomalies. Um, the Zeus section, and this is not the same section and gradient section that I just showed you, but once again, it, it shows, clearly shows the, uh, the deposit sitting on the upper flank of, of that thing. And then, of course, as Robert Friedland would, has you know, said in his press releases, the deposit clearly goes down 3,500 meters, because that's 3,500 meters from there down to there. Um, I won't comment whether it does or it doesn't. I think they eventually did drill a hole somewhere down in here from the bottom of the shaft, but uh, I don't know what it, 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 it did, and it was long after I left. The other tool we used a lot, uh, and this was quite important, was uh, our ground magnetics. And uh, this, this is the, the, the magnetic map. This is based on 25 meter center readings. It took us a long time to, to generate this. Uh, and there were a lot of meeting, readings that were actually done at 12 and a half uh, meter spacing. And uh, this, this turned out to be a very good tool for, for mapping the geology, and, it's, and especially the structure. You know, and if you look at that little dike coming down there, you can see that it's, it's offset oh, oh, half a dozen times there. So you know, it was, there was a lot of really good structural information come out of this thing. And it, and it clearly defines the, the, you know, the, uh, the, the, low, the low mag here, you know, the magnetic uh, depletion of, of, of magnetite there, and it can clearly trace it on up. And of course, it gets up into here, and it's not so prevalent because now you're A, one very deep with the body, but two, you're back into a more magnetite-rich deposit. Um, there was a, as we progressed to the north here, there was a huge amount of, you know, Robert was very concerned because he didn't own the ground up here. This was held by Entre Gold and uh, still is owned, held by Entre Gold. And we, we kept saying, he kept asking, is, is this thing going to cross over into Entre? And we kept saying, no, it's not, because all of that is, uh, by, is a carboniferous biotite granodiorite, or just a granodiorite. And, so, and there's a big fault there, so it's, it's going to come up here and it's going to stop, so don't worry about it. So we got within 300 meters of that boundary, and there was still pretty high grade, uh, so some of the best drill holes we, we drilled were within 300 meters of that boundary. And Robert said, uh, -uh don't go any further north. Fill, infill drill as much as you want. And he went out and he got a, an earn-in agreement for a joint venture, which they signed in October 2004. And once the, 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 you know, the rains were off, we immediately started heading to the north. It's a pretty impressive site, all those big uh, UDR rigs, 1500s, 2000s, and, or 1500s, 1000, and there's a 5000 in there somewhere as well. And that's the 5,000 coming in on a, on a Antonov 124 into Ulumbata. The low hills here are the, is the granite diorite, and, the, and the, the boundary is right at the base of those things. So Robert was, uh, you know, had, had a reason to be, uh, to be worried. Well, th this is a long section. It's, it's prepared from the, uh, the, the, uh, the modeling that we did on SERPAC. You've got the the 0.6% uh, grade shell and inside here in red is the 2% the grade shell. And that's the boundary with Entree Gold. It clearly went up to the boundary and it went at least 600, 700 meters beyond that. Uh, so it was, it was right that we went and he went and got that stuff. Um, the, uh, the reason that Hugo North is, is so important to the economics of, of, of the deposit, if you take the Hugo North 2% grade shell, the average weighted average grade of that of copper copper equivalent, taking gold into consideration, is almost three and a half percent copper, and this is what's going to be block caved. Uh, so you think of a block cave, very cheap block cave, feeding that kind of grade into a into the into the mill. It's going to be pretty something. However, the the ore reserves are quite a bit less than that because there's a significant amount of dilution from a biotite granite diorite dike in there. Um, sitting here in Southwest Doi, you can see that gold feature there, uh, the shell there. That's the, the gold-rich high-grade copper zone, and, and hole 150 just went through the, through the top of that thing. When you look at it in plan section, well, you can see why it went across the border and, and didn't, get, didn't stop at the granite diorite here. The thing bent, it took a real easterly bend, and then straightened out and continued off going thing. Probably some of the hardest exploration drilling I've ever done, and keep in mind this is 1,200 meters below surface, the top of that thing. Actually, following that thing around that bend was was not a simple thing, and it uh, we lost a lot. We, we we went over the top of it quite a few times before we, we eventually got it uh, got it centered. Um, carrying on, so once once Hugo North was was uh, 
pretty much closed off. Um, we turned our attention to, to look at Haruga, and which is, uh, or look for Haruga, well, into the Javelin concession. I'm getting ahead of myself here. And you can see that there's, there's four pretty uh, decent looking chargeability anomalies down there. And, uh, but we had we'd done some drilling over on this little block on the chargeability features there, and this one was 100% owned by Ivanhoe. And what we found is those things were, were pretty much barren pyrite, but more importantly, they were sitting in carboniferous volcanoclastic sediments. So when we looked at that thing, I mean, that was the obvious choice to go for. Uh, but this also sat in the carboniferous uh, pyroclastic sediments. So we ruled that out. And we looked at these three, and that seemed to be the best, because these were all sitting in, uh, in Lower Devonian rocks. Uh, so that, they, they took precedent, given that the deposit was Lower Devonian, the same rocks as that was hosting the Southwest Ohio deposit up here. So I, I, I changed pace a little bit here with my geophysics, because now I've, I'm, you know, I'm wondering about what the, what the gradient array really is saying to us. I had a bunch of geophysicists chattering in my ear about, you know, this, this stuff doesn't really work that well, Charlie you got to do dipole, dipole. So Grant wouldn't do dipole, dipole. We shouted and screamed at each other about it. So I went and got the geophysics team that was actually working for BHP on our joint venture ground that uh, we had done, we had with them far to the north where they had f flown Falcon and were following up their Falcon anomalies, gravity anomalies with, uh, with IP. I brought them down and they did five lines across this thing you know, with a 30 kilowatt Zong transmitter, a frequency domain, which is supposed to minimize the coupling effects that's prevalent with uh, time domain. And using 100 and 200 meter ABs, separations, they certainly got pretty sizable chargeability anomalies in Hugo North, Hugo South. And more importantly, they, they certainly, the features were very clearly there in the, what we call the Sparrow South uh, IP anomaly. So if you look at the chargeability, the dipole, dipole inverted, this has been, been inverted, the high grade uh, mineralization here in Hugo North now clearly sits uh, up in the chargeability. It seems to be more connected to the, uh, to the chargeability. We didn't know, we hadn't drilled these holes yet, but clearly in hindsight that the, the pyrite that I've described in these holes is probably what's causing, causing that. Although it is centered off to the west of the, uh, of, of the West Bat Fault, but that's probably a function of the inversion process, that the, the black box that the, the geophysicists used to, to produce these things. So thinking, okay, now, and, and, Hugo, and uh, Hugo South was, was very similar. It was on the east flank of the, of the chargeability. So when I decided where I was going to drill on, on Javelin here, I hedged my bet and I put my first hole down the east flank of that chargeability. And I went down through 920 meters, and sort of the last 40, 50 meters, and in and out, I got a little bit of pyrite, very little copper. And eventually at 930 meters, I said, uh-uh, this is, this is it. I can't take it any longer. And because there's absolutely nothing up here where the, we, we should have got the, the mineralization. Because everybody knows that dipole, dipole gives you a pretty good indication of, of the depth of the, of, of the source of the chargeability. I drilled up dip, got exactly the same thing, pyrite right down the bottoms of the holes. But I, uh, we, didn't, we didn't quit there. We, we persisted. And we, we drilled a series of sections, uh, at least four, maybe five. Uh, as we headed south along that chargeability feature. And now when you look at the, the modeling that we did uh, as we were going along, and this is the final product, obviously, but as, as we got to the south end, we, we found that the, the deposit, in fact, was plunging to the north. Uh, I'll also refer to that, that, that and I'm going to show you a slide across there just now. Um, so this is the gradient array uh, across that, that same dipole-dipole uh, dipole section I showed you. Um, which I wasn't paying much attention to. The, 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 I stopped the hole somewhere down at about here. And we went back and we extended that hole some 700 meters and uh, right through the center of the, of the high charge abilities. And uh, so that's where I stopped the hole. This is the geology section. I had a better one than this, but I had to pull it because of real. And um, at near the bottom of that hole down in here, we got 162 meters of 1.4 grams gold and 0.42% copper. All I needed to do was go another 30 meters, and I was, I was into the, the, the upper part of the grade shell that uh, defines the deposit. Um, that's the, the, the Zeus uh, chargeability feature that they got, and clearly the mineralization sits very nicely uh, in the center of that uh, big chargeability feature, and as Robert says, it goes forever going down, and I don't think anybody's ever drilled down there. 
Now, when you come back to uh, the, the very deep, the, the, the continuing northerly plunge of, of Haruga, to what they call Haruga extension, where they'd also done Zunzeus, but they also had a gradient array, and uh, Dave Crane, and this, he drilled these holes after I left in June, and uh, clearly he uh, hit very nice mineralization, very good massive calcopyrite veins and gold, way down deep, and it centers perfectly on the, uh, on the, the Zeus uh, chargeability feature. So that, that ends the geophysics. Um, so in summary, you know, what worked, what didn't. And I had a whole bunch of stuff written, but I, I shortened it down uh, to, the, I think, the important things. When you go into explore a, a whole new area, it's really important you take somebody that, that knows, the, knows the geology of the area. And Garam Jeff was, was certainly that. But it's equally important that you take somebody who understands what he's looking for, and he has the ability to recognize it when he sees it. And Dennis Cox, had he not recognized that, that leech cap and the porphyry copper and the potential of a Chalcosay blanket, you know, BHP wouldn't have come back. They would have walked away. And uh, hard to say whether anybody else would have come along and, and done it. So uh, you, you can't emphasize enough the importance uh, of, of the experience that those two gentlemen brought to the thing. You know, every, a lot, most everything is under cover. The only thing that sticks out of the ground in, in South Gobi, Gobi are, are rhyolite dikes and, 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 and unmineralized granite diorite. Uh, so, you know, that regional aeromagnetic survey that BHP did uh, was very, very useful in understanding the geology. And, it, and, it, and if you were thinking in terms of looking for a porphyry copper, you know, a magnetite-rich porphyry copper with gold in it, and thinking along the lines of, of other porphyries in the, in the southwest, in that uh, leach cap, or in that uh, uh, advanced argillic cap high solvidation system, you, you might recognize the... Uh, the maglo that came extended out of that thing as, as being the, uh, you know, probably a, an extension of high sulfidation mineralization. The gradient array uh, indu induced polarization surveys, which a lot of people don't like, um, but because it, 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 a single array, uh, an omelet doesn't, you, you can't drill on it. It doesn't give you a depth uh, of, the, of the source. But with, with uh, using six uh, receivers, uh, running back and forth between the two, the two AB spacing, and using guys that, you know, teams that are moving electrodes, Grant was running over 100 line kilometers a day collecting that IP data. And that's very fast. And when you're using a, a Mongolian uh, geophysics team, and he had 30, 40 guys on that geophysics teams, all very well trained, all with, you know, doing what they needed to do, you calculate the cost, and that was 20 bucks a line kilometer at 100 line kilometers a day. Very effective. And you get those beautiful big chargeability maps, and, and geologists will look at that and say, yeah, but you, know, you want an anomaly, you do an IP survey, and it'll get an anomaly. True, and a lot of those anomalies are going to be pyrite, also true. But if you, if you took, the, took all of the overburden off and you exposed those, those zones, um, you'd, you'd allow it to oxidize, you'd get, uh, you'd get Gaussens. And any, any exploration of the room will stop and sample the hell of a Gaussen. And it was, and it was stopping and sampling the Gaussens that uh, Robert's diamond team in uh, uh, Labrador uh, is what found Voise's Bay, because it was full of copper, that Gaussen was full of copper and nickel. And, uh, you know, it, it, it worked very, very well. But you don't drill on this stuff. You've got to do depth uh, target definition. You've got to do depth discriminating IP surveys for, for these porphyry coppers. If you, know, if you haven't got the geology to, 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 you know, to model it properly. And there's no question that the gradient array, multiple stacked gradient array, was, was pretty effective, but certainly cost effective. The dipole-dipole array, you know, um, in the end, I, I think I probably wasted my money. And clearly the, the Zeus, which wasn't available when I was there, uh, would certainly seem to be the winner of that. When you're logging the drill core, um, and I see this more in the last few years in Africa, uh, the senior geologists who are doing the, the modeling and all that, they got to go spend a lot of time in the core shack. And, and Emans and David and myself and a couple of the other, the expat geologists, we were in that core shack three, four hours a day looking at that core. I had to be because at nine o'clock in the morning, my phone rang, it was Robert Friedland saying, Charlie, what's in the drill hole today? And you know, he'd read the, the daily report from the day before, and uh, I don't know Robert was, was not a, an appropriate answer. And, and I think even just as importantly, those senior geologists 
I've got to take the time to show the junior geologists. In this case, it was our Mong they were all Mongolians. Um, you know what, what they should be looking at. You know and what, what, what they should be logging and seeing, and, and they must also understand. You know why we're drilling these holes. And uh, I walked around the. I first started drilling, and I'd wander around the core shack and looking over the Mongolian geologist's shoulder, and I'd say, "So where's this drill hole from?" Oh, I don't know. I said, "Wrong answer." You know, and uh, hauled them all in and, and reamed them out and said, not only do I want you guys to know where that drill hole is, I want to, I want to see the, the cross section in your clipboards and you know exactly where on the cross section you are so that you know exactly what you're logging and what you're looking for. And, uh, and not only that, and only then will you actually be able to understand, you know, what it is that we're doing here. And I'm proud to say that today, there isn't a single expat on the uh, Oyetogoi mine geological team. They're pretty much completely made up of the, the young exploration geologists that worked for me during the exploration phase. And finally, and, you know, and Jack touched on this yesterday, you've got to have somebody like Robert Friedland, in this case, who really supports his drilling. I mean, he never gave us hell for drilling a 1,000, 2,000 meter duster. Um, and, and, you know, cause we didn't always get good results, but he, he hung in there and, and really more importantly, he was also able to uh, raise the funds. And uh, I probably accounted for $150 million of expenditures on my drilling. That shaft cost another $150 million as well, all above that. That was all raised by Robert. And finally, the, uh, you know, I'd like to you know, acknowledge the efforts of OTLLC, you know, for permission to give this thing. And I only got permission to give this in at 7 o'clock this morning. Uh, so you can tell what I went through for the last couple of days. And uh, the contributions of the uh, Rio Tinto uh, Mongolian team are you know, working for OTLLC, who actually got a lot of the stuff together that, that I needed to, to make this presentation possible. And of course, uh, I acknowledge some of my colleagues, expats and Mongolians, who I was with for eight years in Oyotogoi. Thank you very much. Okay, it's dead again. <laughs> it's got a mind of its own. Yep. Thank you very much, Charlie. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're really quite grateful to have him here. We know that he had to jump through a number of hoops to be able to share his presentation with us. So I'd like to open the floor up to questions now, if there's any questions for him. We seem to have a very shy group today. Was that good of Presentation. He seems to have covered everything. Okay. No hay ninguna pregunta para Charlie. Acá. A la izquierda. Ya te traen el micrófono. Thank you very much. I would like to know something about the resistivity distribution. Uh, on this deposit. Sorry, what, what? I'm sorry, can you repeat that, please? The resistivity. Oh, resistivity? Res yeah, please. <laughs> well, that's a big topic. Um, <laughs> we honestly didn't you know, use the resistivity that much, to be honest with you. It, it, uh, in Haruga, it was, it was a pretty obvious low resistivity that was prevalent in every one of the gradient array. Um, features as we, as we progress south along uh, the Haruga deposit. And the mineralization seemed to be certainly well within, the, within that uh, resistivity low. And I'm not quite sure, probably the faults, because the, the, the deposit is, is, is fault bounded on, on, on each side. In, in, in uh, Hugo, uh, there really wasn't, uh, I don't recall there, you know, the resistivity being very important at all, quite frankly. Um, there, there certainly was a uh, was a bit more of a resistivity high thanks to the the silicification and and, and the basalts uh, uh, host rock basalts in, in uh, southwest OU, but um, there really wasn't a, an important factor in the uh, in the exploration. Thank you. Any more questions over here? With a microphone, please. Sorry, Robert. Could you make any comment on the surface geochemistry? I might. Since it's mostly covered, I guess there's not much yeah. showing, but there was a molly anomaly at the start. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually did have a, a slide in there that was, um, that was the geochemistry that, that BHP did. We, uh, we ourselves really didn't do any soil sampling per se. The, uh, the, the soil survey that, that BHP did, um, there was an arsenic anomaly 
over central OU because of the anargite, and I didn't say that that drill hole that went down was mostly a covalite arg and argite and chalcosite. So there very much was a, an arsenic anomaly as well as the moly anomaly. Uh, there was no anomalous copper over the top of central, but there certainly was a copper anomaly down on the flank of it, probably the water percolating up and from, from depth uh, precipitated copper at near surface. South Oy, of course, had a pretty, pretty good, very good uh, copper anomaly, but then there's malachite all the way along the, the, the ridge, that, that low ridge of, of, uh, of South Oyu, and there really wasn't much of a copper anomaly in the soils over top of uh, Southwest Oyu. In fact, the, the, the top um, 50 meters over Southwest Oyu or is, is actually, which is, is all highly oxidized and leached, so there really wasn't very much in the way of copper gold in the soils. Yeah. But the rocks, which is why I mentioned it, they gave a pretty strong gold copper uh, anomaly. Now, uh, Barry Smee, who was the, uh, you know, the QP, I didn't talk about QAQC, obviously, for this thing. Uh, it was extremely well done and, and, and very rigorous. And I brought B uh, Barry Smee in right from the very beginning to uh, set up the QAQC program for me. And he being a very good geochemist, I said, all right, Barry, now you got that going go and look at the geochemistry and tell me what else you can do out here because it'd be nice to be able to, to use geochemistry or some form of it to, uh, to look. And he doesn't like the, you know, this um, mobile ion type of thing. Uh, in fact, he poo-poos it. But what he does like is, is the, uh, is the uh, hydrogen sulfide, you know, hydrogen ion geochemistry where you've got you know, hydrogen ion gas coming up along the, the faults and fractures. And uh, because there's an, an enrichment of, of, of calcium along the, the very top, right at the very top skim of, of the soil there, the, the hydrogen coming up actually, uh, these say, dissolves that. So what you get is a, you get a, um, a calcium low, uh, usually along the flanks of the mineralization. And he, and he, and he goes out with a, with a, with a beaker and a, and a pH meter and he scoops up you know, some sand, throws it in a, in, in a beaker of water, distilled water of course, stirs it up, puts his, uh, his uh, pH meter in it and reads the pH. And he, he's looking for uh, you know, you know, the, the pH to go from low, to, from, you know, for, for the calcium depletion, so the pH, D, pH to, to drop obviously. And, um, and it, it, seemed to, it seemed to work over south oil and extending out of the south oil. Um, if you really, really stretched it, you might say there might be something I in Hugo South, but you really had to stretch. I never really agreed with him on that. So, but no, I, it's, you know, soil geochemistry in that environment is really not the, the way to go, which is why I didn't bother with it. There was a lot of soil geochemistry done by Andre Gold over Haruga, and, and, and they had a lot of spurious copper gold highs on it, but it had absolutely nothing to do with the deposit, and that deposit is, 800, 900 meters below you know, that soil surface, so it had absolutely nothing to do. And if you drilled soil anomalies at, you know, over Haruga, you'll never get it. Thank you. Anyone else? Back here, please, on the left. Uh, am I correct in saying that there's a very good gravity anomaly coincident with the oil trend? And if so, is that just due to the basalts, or is that actually reflecting the ore body? You know, we, we, did grav we did ground gravity. I actually had a slide in there, but I had 64 slides when I started out for this thing, and I threw it out of there because I don't think it, it really added to the, to the conversation. To answer your question, yes, there, there, is, there is a gravity trend uh, along the, the extent of, uh, certainly over, over the south, uh, southwest OU and, and central OU and extending out or along Hugo, but I don't think it has anything to do with the deposit. Uh, what, because I couldn't show you a, a good geological cross-section of through Hugo, Hugo North and Hugo South, um, there's about a 400 meter thick package of, of, of younger basalts. Yeah, they're still lower Devonian, but they're, they're big packages of basalts that overlie and hanging all of that deposit. And almost for sure, that's what's giving you the, 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 the gravity feature. And you might, there is a gravity high over, over southwest OU, you know, slightly, but there's one hell of a mag anomaly too. So I, I wouldn't go out of my way to do gravity. Now, BHP came in and they took thousands of square kilometers of, of camel pasture that we had, you know, a, a staked up after the discovery, after hole 150, and they uh, did a deal with and, and they flew Falcon over this thing, and they, they, they covered all of it, you know, one of the biggest Falcon surveys they've ever done. 
and the geophysical wizards at BHP did all kinds of wonderful things with their computers, and, and they thought they could, they could actually recognize the, the mineralization. They overflew, obviously overflew Oyotogoi first. They never really convinced me that they, they could see it, but nonetheless, they, they put a whole bunch of things on the map and, and went out and ran a bunch of geophysics over it. You know, uh, not, they didn't use gradient, they used uh, dipole, dipole stuff. And uh, they drilled a bunch of holes, and as far as I know, at least when I left, all they drilled was pyrite. And I kept poking him in the side and saying, you know what, there's a lot of pyrite sitting above Oyotogoi. You know, you guys might want to think about drilling deeper. And they kept saying, ah, now we've explained the IP anomaly. And I'd be really cautious about doing that, quite frankly. Thank you. Over here, please. That a lot of the, um, the deposits under cover, how big was the alteration footprint that you actually had? Uh, at surface, zero, except for, uh, for central oil. Uh, I mean, there, the, the, had I been able to show you a nice you know, geology slide through that thing, the, um, when you go down through the basalt, you go through uh, uh, sediments, you know, black, black shales, you go through what we call the hanging wall fault, and there's absolutely nothing in that. Now, a, you know, so there's nice black shale that has absolutely no alteration, and that's sitting about, what, 50, 60 meters above the deposit, I think, as I recall. You go through the, you go through the fault, and so maybe the fault uh, actually juxtaposed the hanging wall over top of the deposit after the, uh, after the event. You go into an ignibrite, and um, you know, first you went through a block ash tuff, which didn't have much in it, in the alteration. 20 meters of block ash to a big coarse class like this in a, in a pyroclastic, and then into a into a, a ash flow tuff, and that ash flow tuff was 30, 40, 50 meters thick. Now, as you progress down through that, that's when you started to see the alteration, and and you see calc you see pyrite starting off, and then calc pyrite would come in, and then the calc pyrite would get a little bit stronger. You're also seeing advanced argillic alteration developing in that as well. And as you came down through it, there definitely was an advanced argillic cap to this thing. And then you went out of that, and, and the calcopyrite continued. You're now down into uh, uh, quartz monza diorite, the lower Devonian quartz monza diorite, hosted a deposit. And the calcopyrite uh, continues to increase and grade significantly, and then bornite comes in. And then once you get into, into down into the, down in, a little bit deeper, you go into a thing that we call the QV90, which was basically 90% quartz rock. And we had no idea what the, what the protolith was of that quartz rock. It was eventually determined uh, you know, by a manner of elimination more than anything uh, that it was quartz monza diorite. But uh, as I said to Dick, it's probably a giant A vein, actually. But anyway, it is massive quartz vein, 90% quartz vein. And that was really where the concentration of the, of the copper was, because that was crackle brecciated. And all that little crackle wretches that were, was absolutely filled with boronite and calcopyrite. And in Hugo North, there was very little, uh, very little calc, well, there was virtually no chalcophyte in Hugo North, except right at the very top in, in one, one localized area. More questions? Over here. Microphone. Um, I've got the impression from the content of the talk that uh, your exploration team in targeting and adjusting drill holes and, and planning future uh, holes uh, emphasized really geological observation uh, by the eyeball more than, say, uh, geochemistry down the hole or spectral mineralogy or, or something like that. Can you comment? That's a really good, really good question. I'm, I'm glad you answered that question because I... I didn't want to get into it because I would have, I'd still be up here yakking. Um, I was asked many times by visitors coming in, Charlie, show me your drill plan. You know, I want to, they, they wanted us, because they're putting money in, they wanted to see all of the stakes in the ground that we were going to drill. And they wanted it all laid out. And I said, there is no drill plan. Was, what do you mean there's no drill plan? The drill plan is right there. And uh, myself and my senior geologist, David Emats, uh, Cyril, um, you know, we would spend, you know, we were looking at the core, and they were really looking at the core, and we were modeling this thing. And of course, because they're deep holes, we, have, we had a fair bit of time. Nobody said we had to cut off a hole right now. There was never any factor. I mean, you know, 
the, the commonest thing was, yeah, let's, let's let her go and see what she looks like in the morning. Well, let's see what she's in the afternoon. And, yeah, we'll go one more night and see what we go. And sometimes we'd go three, four days like this. Robert never wanted me to stop it. I had more fights with him trying to stop holes than I ever did trying to start holes. But, you know, once, you know, once we stopped that hole and we'd say, okay, now, where are we going to move the drill? And um, the, the, su the drill supervisor would come in and go, time, guys, I need, I need, I need coordinates. And so we, we, say, we look at each other and say, okay, that's where we're going to drill. That's, that'll do what we want to do. Give him a slip of paper with coordinates, azimuth, dip, and he'd go set the drill home. So, you know, yes, I certainly look at the geophysics as we were doing this stuff. Didn't look at any geochemistry. But, but it was dominantly driven by geology and understanding the geology and the modeling that Emance and David were doing. Agree, Dick? Absolutely. Yep. Thank you. Do we have? I thought I saw one more. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Charlie. A big hand of applause for him. So, I really appreciate it. <laughs>